the private sector does not have a monopoly on competence. In fact, one of the things that was discovered by Steve Goldsmith when he looked at, uh, he, he first ran, ran for mayor as a privatization uh, advocate and in the end became an advocate for competition because he found that the public sector employees very often uh, and their management systems could beat the private sector in a fair competition when they didn't have political patronage uh, holding them back and when they didn't have over-regulated uh, administrative processes holding them back. And by freeing them up, very often he found that they did, uh, in fact, uh, hold their own quite nicely. Sometimes they knew the situation better, they knew the equipment better, they knew the community better, and sometimes that's an important variable. Uh, but just the same, the make or buy decision is an increasingly important part of managing every organization uh, because we are in a global economy and because of technology, uh, communications technology and information technology, where you used to have to have everything close at hand in order to be productive, now in fact you don't have to be. Uh, you can purchase things from other places, you can purchase expertise from other places, and also because of the technical content of much work, very often, even something that you think you can do by yourself, you end up needing help on of one sort or another. Uh, in, a, in a world that's more and more driven by brain power and expertise, it's often the case that you need to find other people uh, to help you. So that is actually what I wanted to talk to you about, which is why contract management and outsourcing is important, what are the central elements of, of this as a management tool, uh, the knowledge a manager needs in order to manage contracts and contractors, the obstacles to contracting, which we, which we saw in the case, uh, when should you and should you not uh, contract? In other words, when is it a good time to make the buy decision and when should you avoid it? And what's the future of this? So we'll talk about that uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, the final exam. Why is contract management important? Well, this is the fundamental. Vertically integrated organizations are being replaced by organizational networks. The, the story I often tell, and I, I'm sure I, I mentioned it here before, is if you look at uh, the Ford Motor Company uh, in uh, the beginning of the 20th century, it's the classic example of the vertically integrated company. Ford owned iron mines, coal mines, and they made steel. They owned rubber plantations and tire factories and they made tires. They made virtually every element, every part of the Model T was made somewhere by Ford. They had their own advertising agency, trucks to ship the cars, and dealerships. Everything from the moment of creation until you're driving the Model T off of the showroom floor was controlled by Ford in a huge vertically integrated company. What's the problem with that? In the short run, when technology isn't that great, maybe we could close this door over here. Uh, in the short run, when technology isn't great uh, and you don't have uh, some of the things that we have today, like cell phones and computers and the internet, you need to assemble all the things for production in one place. Because otherwise you get on the assembly line to make your car and it stops because you run out of something. And so you don't want to run out of anything. And the only way to make sure of that before we have a good road system or transportation system or communication system is to assemble it nearby. And that led to the kind of vertical integration that you see in Ford. But in here's what happens as, as time goes on. Then General Motors comes along. And General Motors doesn't own their own steel company. They buy steel from US steel. US steel can make steel cheaper than GM could or that Ford did. And so Ford is already then working at a competitive disadvantage because a company whose distinctive competence, the only thing it did was make steel, could make better and cheaper steel than the car company that made steel kind of as a sideline. And then as the components of the car become more compl complicated and we have more of a road system and we have more uh, of the technology being adopted by other places, suddenly Ford finds themselves in a competitive disadvantage by the company that was only focusing on the few things that it did well. Okay? 
to the design of the car, the marketing of the car, the assembly of the car, and maybe even making a few of the parts, but certainly not all of them. And so that is, is in essence, how networked organizations have been replacing vertically integrated organizations. And this is happening, this is why, this is the logic of the global economy. Because, you know, everybody laughs about, well, maybe the call center is located uh, somewhere in India. But maybe that's a good idea because the people in that community run good call centers, okay? And maybe the distinctive competence of New York City may in fact be uh, that we can assemble a diverse group of people here from all over the world uh, in brain industries uh, because it's a fun and interesting place to live and it's not that hard to get to and it's a reasonably tolerant place and lately it's been crime, relatively crime free. Okay? So every organization, every place has the thing that it specializes in in the emerging global economy. And the way this, the, the, what allows this to happen is advances in communication, shipping, and transportation technology. You know, when New York City was an industrial city, okay, the west side of Manhattan was filled with docks. If you ever see the movie On the Waterfront, you see stevedores and they're literally carrying boxes off of ships. Well, that isn't how it's done anymore. Now you have to go to New Jersey where somebody operates a crane and takes the container off the ship and it becomes the back of a truck or, the back, or part of a train. Okay? That in and of itself radically changed the geography of New York City because we couldn't fit that stuff in here anymore. And even if we could, you can make more money selling apartments uh, and having high-end stores in Manhattan than, than having printing presses automobile factories or clothing factories. And so increasingly you see this change and it's all part of an emerging global economy. And it makes contracting out a part of this overall picture. Now for a manager what this means is a lot of the work that you manage, the stuff you need for your work is done by people outside of your organization. You're accountable for that work but it's not directly underneath your control. The, the point about contracting out is you have to develop skills that you didn't think you needed, uh, particularly skills in making sure that the services that you get uh, fit your needs. So what are the central themes then of contract management? What do you have to do? What does a contract manager need to do? The first thing is you've got to figure out what are these contractors doing? How do they do their work? How do I motivate them? How do I make them do the things that I need them to do? Okay. I need to create then a system of contractor incentives. Some of it's money, some of it is other things, the same things that, ma that, in that inspire other people. But the other thing you have to do is you have to know what they're doing. How do you track the performance of an organization that you're not part of? So you have to write in your contract the right to find out what the organization is doing. Or in the case, in the case we heard earlier today where, where one of the groups said, we need to have a third party firm come in here and audit performance. Well, you have to get the right to do that. It has to be in your contract that you're allowed to do that. You write your contract poorly and you send your auditor there and they say, oh no, we're not showing you our stuff, it's all proprietary, goodbye. So it has to be in the contract. The other thing a contract manager has to do is get a good price. And how do you know what the price should be? Now, if I used to make the stuff, then I kind of know what it ought to cost. But if I've never bought this stuff before, how do I know? You know, what's the good price of a, you know, of a piece of equipment or of a service? How much does it cost to pick up the garbage or to clean the apartment at night? Who knows? Well, you need to figure that out. And that requires the manager to learn things about the operation that's contracted out. You need to also understand the rules governing purchasing. And the government, there's a lot of rules, but you know, at Columbia University, there are an enormous number of rules. Most large organizations have rules on purchasing. Why? They don't want you selling to your brother, your brother Fred, who then kicks back 10% to you. Okay? You know, I know it's a shock to some of you, because that's how you've been doing business your whole career, but in fact, that's what purchasing, drives purchasing agents crazy. Uh, you have to know something about the network you're contracting with. Who's good? Who's bad at it? Who's corrupt? Who's competent? Uh, 
who knows how to do this. And sometimes you're contracting for something that hasn't been done before. You know, so I work for a company that's been, that's been involved in contracting with Con Ed on energy efficiency services. And this company uh, is delivering a service that Con Ed's never contracted for. And believe me, they're having a lot of trouble figuring out how to manage this contractor uh, because uh, it doesn't fit into their usual practice uh, of what they manage. That they are better at, co at managing their vendors that provide them with the supplies they need than with these particular services. You need to know something about the culture, the motivation, the track record of the contractor. So it's not a turnkey operation like the mayor of Atlanta wanted to see with uh, the water system. You actually have to know quite a bit uh, to buy something. I mean, think about when you go and buy a car, okay? I mean, this is a, you know, obviously we all make the buy decision here. None of us here, I think, are making cars. Anybody here ever make a car? <laughs> there are people that do that, I know, but I, I don't. So I have to go buy. Now, what's the problem when I'm, when I'm buying a car? Well, first of all, I know nothing about cars, and it's obvious by the cars I buy <laughs> and the price I get and the reliability of what I buy, <laughs> okay? Because I don't know anything about it. I go in there and, I, and, the, and they, they give me a whole song and dance, and I have no knowledge of what's going on in front of me, okay? Obviously, I don't think it's that important. I live in Manhattan. I don't have to drive that much, okay? But the, the point is to be an effective purchaser of something, you want to know something about it. You need to have resources and analyses of, of what makes a good car. The same thing is true of a contractor. So let's talk about the obstacles to contracting and how they're overcome, because there's a whole bunch of problems in buying stuff, okay? You know, one of them is the ignorant buyer, which I just talked about. But th then you have, when you are buying something and you want competitive bidding, you issue what's called a request for proposal, or you put out to the world in one form or another uh, a set of requirements saying, bid on this. Tell me what you can, what you can provide for this. Uh, what happens when you don't know what you want to buy? Your specifications are off. Well, what happens if, if nobody knows? In other words, sometimes when uh, the military, for example, is developing a new weapon system, they actually contract to develop the specifications for the later contracts because they don't know what they're trying to buy. Okay? So solutions to this problem are you can create what's called a mission contract, a very large general contract, and as you learn what you need, you write specific task orders against the contract. Or you can try a pilot project, a small set of contracts, maybe a few competing projects, to learn, to try to figure out, well, what do we need to buy here? Okay, so those are ways around um, that particular problem. Sometimes you have cumbersome contracting procedures where it takes a long time to buy something. And so sometimes what you have to do is use an existing contract and try to squeeze your purchase into that. Um, of course, some, what you could do is work to streamline the procedures, try to figure out a more effective way to buy. Uh, but very often you find that even buying something uh, can be very difficult. Sometimes you find that you put something out for bid and nobody bids, okay? Uh, or only one company bids. And if only one company bids, then you've got a monopoly situation. And that may tell you that this particular service should not be contracted out because there aren't enough bidders for you to really get a good price. There is no competition. It's too specialized. And maybe you need to figure out a different way of getting that service provided. Maybe you have to develop your own capacity in-house because you really can't buy it. And you often see that uh, with new technologies, where there isn't anybody available to do that. A lot of the issues around uh, green building and solar technology is a shortage of installers, of people that know how to do that work. And so sometimes if you need it, you actually have to send somebody to school to figure out how to make it happen. Another obstacle is poor communication between the buyer and the vendor. Now we saw this in Atlanta, okay, where in the end, all organizational relationships come down to informal human relationships. No matter what the contract says, no matter what the, no matter what the, the legal language says, is this a good working relationship? Do I have a friend in the other company? Does, do I have somebody on my staff who at least hangs out with somebody on their staff that can provide communication 
and really figure out what needs to be done here to make stuff happen. And then also we need informal communication in the process of bringing about this contracted function. In other words, once you let the contract, it's not a turnkey operation. Now we have to have meetings together. Now we have to have lunch together. You know, occasionally we have to do retreats together where we really work together as a team because otherwise uh, the, the, the activity that you're contracting out will fall apart. You need clear milestones and performance measures. That's to be clear what you're buying. What is it we're buying? When is it due? What's the definition of quality? Very often a vendor doesn't know what you're asking for. And so a problem in contracting out is you've never really explained what you're looking for. Sometimes it's because you don't know. Okay? And sometimes it's also because people in both organizations are afraid to talk. They interact with each other at the field level and they know that there's something wrong but they're afraid to tell the boss because there's always the shoot the messenger issue. So communication between buyer and vendor is important. Sometimes the problem is inadequate direction from the purchaser to the vendor. Sometimes it's because the purchaser has conflicting objectives. One part of the company or the organization wants one thing. Another part wants another thing. And instead of, dis instead of settling the disagreement, they, they make their conflicting demands on the contractor, and that poor schnook has to figure out how to reconcile these competing demands. Sometimes it's political. Sometimes the political struggle in the purchasing organization is settled by who gets to buy something. And so the, the vendor, again, is a political pawn. Uh, in the battle between competing forces uh, in the organization. That happens in the private sector as much as it happens in the public sector. Uh, politics is not limited to the government. I mean, I know a lot of you know that because you work in private companies and you know about the politics uh, that are there. And there is, a, there is of course, a, uh, there's a rule about politics, which is that the level of conflict is usually an inverse ratio to the stakes. So the least important things get the most intense conflict. And uh, conflict in politics is in every organization. Uh, there's the famous statement, uh, you know, Dwight Eisenhower was the president of Columbia University uh, after he left NATO, uh, just before he ran for president of the United States. And during uh, his announcement press conference, uh, one, of the, one of the questions the press asked is, why are you leaving uh, academia for the, for the political world and running for president? And he said, I was hoping for a job that was a little uh, less political than being president of a university. So if you think that politics is limited to the government, uh, it's not the case. Sometimes this inadequate direction is because the organization that's purchasing is really poorly managed. We certainly saw this in Atlanta, that you saw a problem of the vendor not being able to get clear direction. And so a lot of the problems in contract management or in contractor performance is really a reflection of the organization doing the purchasing. They've got problems and they just pass it along to the companies that they're working for. Sometimes what happens is the contractor gives an organization's work a low priority. And this happens when, you know, if you think about the structure, let's take a typical consulting firm. Now, anybody here work for a consulting firm? Okay. So in consulting firms, most of the, the uh, resources and the uh, most of the, the uh, incentives go to people that bring in business, okay? Those are the rainmakers. In fact, uh, a friend of mine once divided the consulting world into three parts. He said there's finders, minders, and grinders. The finders are the rainmakers, the people that find business. The minders are the project management. And the grinders are people with recent master's degrees that do all the work, okay? <laughs> Uh, and so if all of the incentives in the company are delivered to the people that bring in business, then you're going to have a lot of people that are good at getting business, but maybe not so good at performing once the business is won. And you see that very often uh, in organizations uh, that may have a lot of flash and a lot of good sales, but not so good at performance. And so what do you do? Well, first of all, you develop contract mechanisms to make sure you get performance, reviews, milestones, sanctions. Sanctions can work pretty well, as can incentives. Um, you know, the, uh, there's lots of examples, particularly in, in road construction and in things like that, where uh, if, the, uh, if the road repair is done 
faster. Uh, every week you get it done ahead of schedule, you make a little extra money. Uh, every week you're behind schedule, you lose a little bit of your fee. And those kinds of incentives uh, do have an impact. The other thing is you can publicize contractor failures. If a contractor doesn't perform and you're in the government, uh, you can make sure people know about it. If you're in the private sector, you can make sure people know about it. These, this firm is not uh, reputable. Sometimes the contractor tries to lowball performance. They're trying to, to squeeze every dollar out of the contract, and so they're not giving the latest equipment or the well-trained staff uh, to perform those tasks. What do you do? Well, first of all, you can uh, audit, and you can have penalty and cancellation clauses if you see that what you're asking for isn't happening. Sometimes there's political opposition to the idea of contracting. Sometimes it's just people inside the organization don't want to have an outside vendor involved in it because they want to keep the jobs to themselves or their friends or the old way of doing things. Um, so that can be part of it. And certainly in, in a unionized environment, you sometimes see uh, a resistance to outsourcing because it's seen as a way of busting the union. Uh, and one way around that is to, ha is to insist in the contract that the union, that the contracted uh, service is also unionized. And that can get around uh, that particular argument if that becomes important. Sometimes you have political or senior management interference in contractor selection. They have their favorite firm, Maybe they're getting a little piece on the side, uh, and they want to make sure you pick that contractor. So that has to be resisted. Uh, I, I think that uh, the issue of corruption in purchasing uh, and contracting out really needs to be understood. Uh, as a rule of thumb, uh, I should say that whether you're in the public, private, or nonprofit sector, uh, you know, it's a slippery slope. You know, the, uh, uh, a bottle of scotch at Christmas is suddenly a fancy dinner, is suddenly a trip to the Bahamas uh, in the private jet of the corporation, and so on and so forth. And before you know it, uh, you're on the take. And so there's a very simple way to deal with that, which is to always resist. Just say no. Don't take the present. Return it gracefully and gratefully. Say, thank you for the scotch. Uh, but I'm not allowed to accept these kinds of things. No matter what you're in, whatever business you're in, be very careful about that. Um, it can create the reality, the appearance of impropriety. It's worth resisting. I say it's often a subject of exit voice or loyalty. There's a, there's a book, a public sector book, by a fellow named Albert Hirschman called Exit Voice and Loyalty. And in the book, um, it deals with the question, what do I do when I'm told to do something that I think is wrong? and I work at an organization. So he says that you have three options. You can exit, say, I'm leaving. I'm not going to be a part of this. Uh, you could decide that it's so important I have to be a whistleblower and go public. That's the voice option. Or you can say, you know, in the grand scheme of things, I don't like this, but it's not unethical. I'll go along with it. I'll be loyal to the organization, and I'll live to fight another day. So those are the three options when you're faced with unethical uh, behavior, whether it's contracting or anything else. Uh, there's a fourth one I've written about, which is called guerrilla warfare, which is you very quietly within the organization fight things. Um, but that, I think, is also a slippery slope. I kind of like the exit voice and loyalty formulation, although people do the guerrilla warfare all the time. Another obstacle to contracting is poor performance measurement systems. The measures of what the contractor is doing are measuring the wrong thing. or the collection system or the analysis system or the reporting system of those data is also inadequate. And so you can find that that's a problem with contracting. You can't contract something if you don't know what's going on. So without a good data system, you can't tell whether the contractor is performing or not. So you have to specify this in the contract. You have to specify the indicator, the way it's collected, how you get it, and how it's audited. Okay, because if an unaudited performance measurement system is a work of fiction. And so you want to, and, and contracting is even more important because these people don't work for you. Now, you always have the option of ending the contract. So it's not like you have no power. You can always say, okay, well, I'll wait till this contract's over and we'll get a new contractor. But meanwhile, you're getting crummy service. Sometimes you have insufficient auditing of performance measures. And so uh, I've just made this point. I won't go over it again. 
except to say that, that there's always a way to check on the accuracy of information. And if you don't check on it, uh, you should assume it's not accurate. Sometimes you have inadequate incentive provisions or misdirected ones. Um, you need to link in every organizational relationship. The people in the other organization have to have a reason for giving you what you need. That reason can be money, it can be repeat business, it can be a variety of other things, but incentives in organizational behavior are always central, and they're no less central in a contracted relationship. Sometimes you have conflict of interest issues, uh, which I mentioned before, uh, which is to say that in both government or in the nonprofit sector and the private sector, uh, sometimes you may find yourself in a purchasing situation with a company run by somebody that you know or you have a financial interest in or your wife knows or your brother knows uh, or is your brother. And in all of those cases, if you're a decision maker in those situations, you have to recuse yourself and say, I have a conflict of interest here. I'm not going to participate in this. You guys do that. Okay? Uh, it's extremely important uh, to do this. And this is also a reason why uh, contracts that are decided by panels are often better than contract decisions made by individuals. Because in a panel, there's a certain amount of transparency and visibility, at least within the organization. It can still be confidential to the outside world, but within the organization, the decisions can be made by more than one person. A union opposition to contracting I mentioned. Um, the other issue is you know, there's a lot of attention in the media to privatization and contractor failures. There's, you know, uh, one of the things we're seeing right now in this cutback environment is somehow uh, contractors are all wasteful. Every contract is wasteful. It could always be done cheaper by people inside. Uh, now, this issue of competence and price is not an issue related to the make or buy decision. Sometimes it's cheaper to do it in-house. Sometimes it's cheaper to contract it out. Sometimes it's more competent if you do it in-house. Sometimes you can get more competent people on the outside. It is not a function of whether it's a public, private, internal, or external uh, organization. Uh, this is really a, a, a fallacy that has very little to do with organizational analysis and everything to do with politics, uh, both within corporations and with government. So let me turn to the question of when should you and when shouldn't you contract out? Well, in the case of government, the issue of accountability and control is one of the things I think about. But I also think about this in, in the private sector. In other words, if I absolutely must have minute-to-minute -minute control of something in my hands, then it, it may, I might not want to have a purchaser-vendor relationship. I would want an employer-employee relationship. Okay? So, that's, so it's when the need for accountability is extreme. And this is why I don't like uh, you know, police services that are contracted. Not to say security services can't be contracted, but I'm talking about police services. Police services being when somebody can remove you from freedom or life. That's a police service, okay? And that's something that should not be contracted out. Um, another time not to contract that out is when purchasing the service would impair the organization's capacity and distinctive competence. So what do I mean by that? I've, I've talked about Columbia. Columbia does education and research. Okay? I should not contract out what I'm doing right now. This is pretty central to what the university does, right? Teaching students in a classroom. Okay? So if somebody in the School of Continuing Education gets the idea, you know, these internal professors are too expensive, we can get somebody cheaper from the outside, you know, that would be a bad idea. Because then people would say, well, why don't I just go to the University of Phoenix? Why am I bothering with Columbia? The other time when it's not a good idea to contract out is when the capacity to do the work has not yet been developed. Now, sometimes you do have to contract out to develop capacity. But know that's what you're doing. Don't make the mistake of thinking it's out there when it's not. If something doesn't exist yet, whether it's a new piece of technology or it's a new service that hasn't been developed yet, uh, you can work with vendors to develop it, but you're working with vendors to develop it. And, that, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that, but don't mistake that for buying something off the shelf. So 
what is the make or buy decision and how do you make it? What's an organization's distinctive competence and why is it important? These are the questions a contract manager has to ask. What is accountability and why isn't it important? Well, and why is it important? I'm sorry. When shouldn't an organization outsource? These are all questions a manager has to ask when they're involved in the contract relationship. So let me talk about them a little bit at a time here now. First, the make or buy decision. Should we do it in-house? Should somebody else do it? So here's the factors to ask yourself. How central is the function to the organization? You also have to ask how much capital is required. Okay? Maybe we have no choice. Maybe we can't come up with the money to do this if we don't get an outsider involved. Okay? And so you, you make a buy decision because you simply have no capacity to make the thing, even though you'd like to. Remember, a lot of organizational choices are suboptimal. You have to ask yourself, is the capacity to perform this function common or rare? Is it something we need to develop, or would it be better to have somebody else develop? In other words, if I spend the time developing this new capacity in-house, let's say I'm the Air Force, instead of contracting with Boeing or Lockheed to develop that new fighter jet, if we decided to do it in-house, would that make any sense? Is the Air Force really about building jets, or is it about using the jets in fighting? Obviously, one is a, their distinctive competence, the other isn't. Can someone else do this better and cheaper, and are they willing to sell it to us? Okay, one other issue, and again, we see this with the Defense Department all the time, is when they have a single vendor, that vendor has a monopoly, and suddenly, even though you pay to develop a thing, the price goes through the ceiling because they know they've got you. Okay, so part of it is trying to figure out a way around that, which is very hard to do sometimes. Organizational distinctive competence. I talked about this when we talked about organization theory. What does that mean? In order for an organization to survive, it has to do something that nobody else does to get resources. And this comes from Chester Barnard and Philip Selznick, two of the great organizational theorists of the 20th century. And what they said is that the function of the leader is to look up into the organization's environment and see where can we get resources, what can we make that will get us resources, and down into the organization to develop d the distinctive competence. If an organization doesn't do something that nobody else does, then they don't get business. Okay? Now you could be the only cappuccino cart on Broadway and 110th Street and that means that's your distinctive competence and you want to make sure that you're not contracting that out. Okay? Uh, whatever it is, you have to think about what do we do here that nobody else does. If an organization gives that away, uh, then they find themselves in trouble and eventually uh, they go out of business. An organization's distinctive competence defines what an organization is. It says, here's what we are, here's what we do. Okay? Now, this is not to say that distinctive competences are static. And you know, one of the best examples of it is on the board here. IBM invented, in many respects, the mass PC, you know, and they don't make them anymore. They sold the business. They got out of it. They found that their distinctive competence was not in mass marketing consumer computers. They're still in the server business, but they're not in the PC business. Okay? New York City's Human Resources Administration used to deliver all the social services in New York City. Now, nearly all the social services in New York City are, de are delivered by nonprofit organizations in contract with the, the city, either the Human Resources Administration or the Department of Homeless Services, okay? or, the children's, or, or the Agency for Children. All of these kinds of organizations evolve over time. Now, one of the things you have to do when you outsource is maintain the capacity to manage the function. And this was this issue of the hollow state. If I contract something out to such a degree that I have nobody in the organization that knows what the service looks like, eventually uh, I'm going to lose the capacity to even manage that service. And so you can't have a problem of over-contracting. Let me talk a little bit about accountability. One of the reasons why the Agency for Children's Services was created in New York was that a little girl uh, was killed uh, because the foster care parents that uh, were caring for her uh, were evil people and they killed her. 
And Rudy Giuliani was mayor then. He went in front of the media and he said, it wasn't our fault, we contracted this out to the nonprofit. Guess what? Nobody cared. They said, you're responsible. You're the, you're the officer on duty. And, uh, and I think in the end, Rudy understood that was the case and they created uh, the Agency for Children's Services and, and he brought his old friend uh, Scapetta to run it. Uh, and that was all about uh, accountability. So accountability, you know, contracting doesn't change the demand for accountability. And in the private sector, if you're responsible for the production of a contractor, telling your boss, well, it's a vendor that messed up, they don't care. You messed up. And so you have to manage that. So accountability is always important when you're dealing with these kinds of relationships. So management has to know that they have information on, on performance. Contracting changes the nature of management influences and control, but it doesn't change the necessity of control. You still have to understand what's going on. So let me talk a little bit about the future of contracting. First of all, you're going to see more and more of this. Organizations are becoming more and more specialized. I'll give you an example. Uh, anybody here work in event planning? Anybody know what that is? Event management? Anybody work in that? Okay. There's, there are companies now that you go to when you have a conference and they run your event for you. Or you have a fundraiser and they run your event for you. It's a, event planners. Okay. This is a profession that didn't exist 20 years ago. Okay. But you can contract out for that and have it done for you. There's almost nothing that's done in an organization that isn't done by somebody that you can buy whether it's accounting services or bookkeeping or any number of things in an organization can be contracted out. And you're going to see more and more of this, in part because of the, the, the other technological factors that are contributing to this are, and I'll say this again, communications and information. The price of communication and information is getting lower and lower. Think about this for a second. 20 years ago, if you were making a call to Europe or California, you would think, Oh, it's a long distance call. How much does it cost? How many of you think about how much a phone call costs now before you make it? Anybody think about that anymore? Okay, we have one person left who still thinks about it. Okay. But that used to dominate your thinking because it was expensive. Same thing with information. You know, information is ubiquitous. Do you think about how, ex you know, every year computing power gets cheaper and cheaper and we get used more and more of it in our daily lives? So that allows us to manage ever more distant vendors in different kinds of relationships. You know, very often an organization decides not to tie up its capital in having a big warehouse with supplies for its production. They use just-in-time techniques where they have FedEx deliver it or UPS deliver it just as they need it. And they know it's coming because it, just like you track, you know, is my uh, you know, Hanukkah or Christmas present getting to Aunt Mabel? And you're looking on the web to see, well, it just made it, made it through Kentucky. Now it's in Newark. Just made it to the Bronx. It just got signed in in Aunt Mabel's building. OK? Well, the people that run organizations do this electronically on everything they order all the time. And some companies have perfected that uh, into a fine art form. Well, we're going to see more and more of this, more linking uh, performance management systems to what contractors do. Walmart does this uh, in everything they purchase. Their information system extends all the way out into Procter & Gamble. They know where every, 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 tooth, every toothpaste tube that they're buying, they know where it is in the manufacturing process and where it is until it leaves their store. Uh, so obstacles to contracting are going to be overcome. We're going to see more and more of this as time goes on.